program of Hands-On Engineers for Modern and Auditory Research. My name is Mariana Ceci and I will be your host for this lecture. Today, we are going to watch the lecture of Professor João Sato. Mr. Sato is a professor at the Center of Mathematics, Computation and Cognition at the Federal University of ABC located in São Paulo, Brazil. He focuses his researches on the quantitative methods in neuroscience, with multidisciplinary studies in statistical and computational modeling neurosciences, neuroimaging, functional and structural mapping of the human brain, time series analysis, and others. This event was brought to you by the Santos Dumont Institute, the Federal University of Rio Grande do Norte, the State University of Campinas, the University of São Paulo, the Federal University of ABC, Brain Support, and Narex Medical Technologies. So let us all please welcome Mr. João Sato. Hi, how are you doing? It's a pleasure to be here. And, and can you hear me, Mariana? Is, is it working? Uh, great. And uh, thank you so much for uh, Edgar for the invitation to be here. It's an honor and a pleasure. Um, let me just start projecting my, my slides. Okay, so um, is it working? Can you see the, the slides, Mariana? Okay, great. So, um, well, as Mariana said, uh, my name is João Sato, and I'm from the Federal University of the Region of ABC in the neighborhood of Sao Paulo. And today I will talk about some challenges and difficulties on FNR's experiments. And um, some matches uh, between the design and the data analysis of FNR's research. Okay, so uh, just a uh, brief uh, uh, introduction. Um, I am a Brazilian, <laughs> third generation from uh, two Japanese immigrant families, uh, my mother and my father. And uh, it's a shame uh, I cannot speak a word in Japanese. And, um, but I, I, I'm very proud <laughs> for my, uh, uh, from, from being a Japanese descendant. And um, the, in, here in the map, this is uh, South America, and I'm located in the city of Sao Paulo, here in the, the, the red spot, um, where, uh, from where I'm streaming now. And uh, Sao Paulo is a urban area and the lar largest city in Brazil, and uh, it is very far from uh, the famous Amazon, Amazonia at the north. And uh, please uh, do not think that we live in forests and, uh, with monkeys uh, ar going around in the streets. Uh, this is a very business city, just like London and New York. And uh, oh, sorry, I forgot here. And uh, actually, uh, what is missing in the city is the trees and the, you know, more green areas. Uh, actually, it is a city full of skyscrapers. And, well, these two pictures uh, of the, on the bottom are um, from the university uh, I work at the region of uh, ABC, and um, which is located at the neighborhood of Sao Paulo City. Um, well, um, <clears throat> I, I would just present uh, 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 just a little bit of my background so you can better understand the context and the motivation for the questions uh, which uh, uh, I will present later. Um, I'm a statistician uh, and I focus on time series analysis. And after my graduation, I worked in some hedge fund companies but, uh, well, you know, I was not uh, doing, uh, I felt I was not doing uh, enough so, uh, uh, social good. <laughs> so I decided to move my career to medical research in a public hospital. And uh, I realized that time series analysis could be very useful to the development of methods for functional connectivity analysis. And during my doctorate, um, 
I started working with task fMRI, the functional magnetic resonance imaging, and uh, I spent some time at the Institute of Psychiatry at King's College London. And since then, I, I started investigation, uh, investigating the neural correlates of psychiatric disorders using structural MRI and fMRI. And, well, the, the research highlighted the importance of uh, childhood and adolescence to the onset of mental uh, uh, disorders, which, uh, which led me to the study of typical and atypical neurodevelopmental trajectories. And inevitably, this uh, research um, uh, then led me to the interfaces uh, between neuroscience and education, uh, which is actually my, my main interest uh, at the moment. And, well, very important. <laughs> uh, uh, well, we are now uh, facing uh, many challenges because of the pandemics. And this is why, um, well, we are uh, streaming. <laughs> um, so, uh, in favor of uh, our mental health, I, pre I prefer to keep this, this talk uh, light and more informal. <laughs> okay. So uh, I prepared this presentation in the format of a conversation to share my experiences as a, you know, uh, as a potential uh, collaborator. I, I would like to co cooperate with you, collaborate with you. And this will not be a, you know, a formal uh, lecture um, given by a guru. <laughs> so this uh, why I started my talk uh, this way. So... Um, well, my wish is to be useful to each one of you, and I will, would like this this presentation to be very, you know, like a conversation and in the comfort of uh, the couch of your house, <laughs> uh, and I think it can be because you are at home or, or at work, and I, I plan to discuss some issues in real life neuroscience, experimental design data analysis, and some, you know, tips and recommendations um, from the experience I, I had working with FNIRS um, this last decade. So, um, I will start posing this question. Why should we use FNIRS? The first time I, I had contact with FNIRS was in 2007, in the context of um, uh, mapping uh, the uh, epileptogenic focus. And uh, at that time, I was uh, working uh, intensively with task fMRI. And, uh, well, uh, it happens that uh, everyone knows that uh, fMRI, uh, by being based in uh, magnetic resonance, uh, um, principles uh, has a much better, uh, a higher uh, uh, spatial resolution than NEARS. So, uh, honestly, at that moment, I did not see a very good reason to use uh, uh, FNIRS, uh, despite the, 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 the relative low cost. And uh, so, uh, my conclusion and this was a very wrong conclusion at that time, was that, you know, perhaps, well, I live in Brazil, so perhaps FNIRS was just an fMRI replacement for researchers without budget. And, well, remember that I, I live in Sao Paulo, Brazil, so, uh, of, of course, we, we, we face some challenges on research budgets. And, uh, you know, looking to this picture, we, we see this inequality, né? So, uh, unfortunately, this uh, is a sad scene, which is not uncommon here, mainly in Sao Paulo. So, poverty is one of the main problems here. And, uh, well, this picture shows a building with private pools in the balcony uh, and right in the side of Paraisopoli favela, and uh, which is one of the, the biggest favelas uh, in Brazil. So, uh, 
On the other hand, regarding uh, scientific research, I was fortunate to be in, in, in the, 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 the rich side, the wealthy side of the, this wall, working in a, a radiology department in, in some very good and wealthy hospitals uh, in Sao Paulo. So I, uh, being so, I had access to high field MRI scanners and uh, the, the, well, you know, the, the best technology one can ha could have. So uh, money and infrastructure were not really a problem at that time. Remember that this was a 2007. Yeah. Uh, of course, uh, uh, the, this was not a problem for research. For personal matters, is, is a completely <laughs> another story. Uh, being a, a researcher, uh, Edgar, and you know all, all Brazilians here know that being a researcher in Brazil is really, really a big challenge regarding personal life. Um, you know, for, for for many reasons that uh, I will not. This is a matter for an, another conversation. And so, um, <coughs> um, so thus, I, I was mostly working with fMRI publishing and very happy with with it. So, um, but deeply, the, you know, the same reason that once brought me. Remember that I, I worked before in hedge funds companies. So the, the same reason that brought me from the financial area to the medical research, you know, start um, coming back and, and disturbing me uh, again. Um, so if for someone from the neuroimaging field, the sentence is probably not common for you. So uh, the, the, the in the near future we will be using fMRI for clinical practice, uh, diagnosis, and, you know, practice guidance, personalized meds, and and something like that. And you know, well, let me make it uh, uh, clear. I, I'm still an fMRI researcher. I'm indeed very enthusiastic about uh, fMRI, and I really. I truly believe that this sentence is true, uh, perhaps not in a so near future. Um, this is debatable. Um, I, I'm still working on publishing uh, many studies based on, on fMRI and psychiatry and neurodevelopment, and I really don't intend to leave this field. Um, but, uh, well, uh, more than papers, I, I think you, you start being concerned with social good that you can bring to your community. And uh, mainly if you believe that, you know, research and education have a potential to, to make this change um, in a country like Brazil. Um, I, I think people from, from Natal, probably they... they, 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 they May feel the same. So um, you start, you know, being anxious with the uh, real use of uh, the knowledge you discover in applications, and to the end, perhaps uh, uh, advances and progress in fMRI is a bit too slow for for, for this innovation. And uh, <clears throat> in, in in countries like developing countries, MRI technology will not be uh, a, a reality uh, uh, in, in, in the next decades for most patients, because it is, it is very expensive. So this led me to the field of applied neuroscience, uh, specifically uh, the interfaces between neuroscience and education. And you know, remember that, that the pre previous picture. So I want to build a bridge between the, the two, two, two words. This is my, you know, my dream, my, uh, what I think is my mission now. So uh, come back to the question, why should we use FNIRS? So, um, of course, it, it could be a, a, a tool uh, for, you know, a small budget uh, 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 or a, but 
or, or applications that cannot be afforded, but ma many applications that cannot be afforded by fMRI scanner. But, you know, I started making the following question. Uh, what could we do with FNIRS that is impossible or, or very, very hard to do with MRI, fMRI? Mm. So um, my view uh, and the perspectives I had on FNIRS changed completely when I started thinking uh, 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 this way. So um, what could we do with FNIRS that it's impossible to do with fMRI. So uh, instead of being uh, a low-cost replacement for, for MRI scanner, it could be a, a very powerful tool for you know, uh, research topics that were not explored before. And uh, ma um, mainly regarding uh, this uh, uh, um, applied field outside the MRI uh, environment. So, and of course, that uh, uh, um, FNIRS has many specificities and also some limitations. And, but uh, despite there are many things in, uh, um, in common uh, with fMRI due to the nature of the, the, the bold signal, the, the physiological phenomena, um, it is not a simple uh, transposition of the protocols or data analysis. Uh, so uh, we need some development. And uh, the first contact we had uh, in the lab at, the, at my university, uh, so uh, this question led us to the, this, some experiments we, we presented in this paper, which was published in two, uh, 2017. And the main aim of this paper was not to answer uh, a point on on brain functioning, but to demonstrate that even without some very sophisticated signal processing, uh, uh, which is very common uh, in, in, in neuroimaging, we, we could still see some, you know, some very promising results and features uh, uh, um, in the signal that really made sense, make sense. And it was not only pure noise or, or artifacts. And since my background was in, in statistics, uh, you know, any statistician knows that uh, if you need too many, you know, uh, uh, crap processing, and uh, you need to torture the data, um, the re reliability uh, of results uh, is, is poor. So, uh, in other words, if if you need um, to work uh, to to apply too many complicated steps um, to analyze your data. Uh, perhaps you are, you know, uh, forcing the, the the method to get uh, 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 the results. <coughs> um, so <coughs> we designed. Um, <coughs> oh, sorry. <coughs> uh, we designed some uh, experiments to check uh, 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 the signal quality and the. Um, and the potential findings, such as table tennis player, piano playing, or you know, a violin <clears throat> doing hyper scanning. And uh, we observed two things. First, uh, of course, uh, uh, um, the, the signal quality was compromised according to the level of motion required to perform these tasks. For example, a, a, a forehand ball in table tennis. Uh, requires more movement than only uh, um, more movement than rest, and a backhand or forehand ball requires more movement than only forehand. And you can see that the signal quality uh, here in, in this uh, uh, desk, this box plot, uh, uh, is different in this situation. But the movement artifacts are not huge, so somehow we, we believe that they, they, they could be handled. And second, uh, surprisingly, uh, uh, the preliminary results, the, the, the regions uh, highlighted, uh, and they also the, the signal change, were uh, exactly as we, we, we had previously hypothesized, and without the needs of torturing the data. So we had <clears throat> uh, increased prefrontal activity in the more complex conditions, in this case, unpredictable uh, uh, sites 
of the ball in table tennis, and the more complex polyrhythmic uh, condition in piano. <clears throat> and note that the movement uh, um, artifacts uh, in, is almost the same in the conditions we are comparing. <clears throat> so, uh, <clears throat> We were very impressed by these preliminary findings, uh, even because motion artifacts is, uh, are very strong in, in fMRI. So we decided to investigate more deeply uh, 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 the, the placement of uh, the layouts of the optodes um, for uh, you know the FNIRS channels, um, which could uh, uh, per, sorry. Uh, we would like to investigate the channels which could be more prone to movement artifacts. <clears throat> so uh, we design a block design finger tap experiments with different uh, forced uh, intentional artifacts, which are common uh, movements in per interpersonal <clears throat> in communication, uh, not in up, uh, down, sideways, uh, speaking aloud and are raising uh, the eyebrows, forcing this uh, uh, raising eyebrows. And uh, so we explored the impact of this artifact with a montage covering the, the whole left hemisphere with uh, a cap, um, um, a cap uh, fixed in the chin uh, or chest. And as a measure of the, the impact, of these artifacts, we considered uh, a sliding window and the, uh, um, over the signal <clears throat> and the calculation of the oxide, the oxygen hemoglobin correlation across time. Um, because we expect the, the correlation between these two chromophores to be uh, negative and then we, to be negative. And also the signal coefficient of uh, variation, the CV, uh, which I will present in the next slide. And uh, the coin D statistics was used to, to quantify the effect size of uh, these artifacts. Um, this is the, the, the maps of the coefficients of variation. <clears throat> um, and our uh, results suggest that the cap fixation at the chin was slightly more robust than uh, the chest. And that eyebrows was the most harmful, uh, uh, arm, uh, raising eyebrows was the most harmful artifact uh, on the signal quality. <clears throat> and uh, so uh, speaking artifacts were not so high and they were affecting mostly the, uh, the inferior channels and nodding up, down, up and down or sideways was uh, uh, the, the movement uh, uh, which less uh, impact uh, in, in the signal. A second problem we wanted to address was the, the montage layout. So uh, the numbers of optodes is usually is often limited. Uh, it's not like fMRI that we have voxel uh, uh, acquisitions. Uh, so uh, it's often limits, uh, the number of optodes is limited for a whole head covering. Uh, and uh, the placement of the, the optodes uh, is in principle uh, arbitrary, arbitrary. So in, uh, in fMRI, it's very frequent to use some, uh, uh, we call the region of interests uh, for uh, using anatomical atlases or some, you know, uh, uh, regions um, from previous uh, functional studies. Um, in this paper uh, I, I'm presenting this slide, we introduced uh, a free toolbox de developed by Guilherme Zimiu, <coughs> Zimiu to automatically uh, create this uh, layout uh, given an atlas. So the idea is that you can uh, Go to next slide. So, uh, you, if you had an atlas uh, containing clusters of voxels, uh, and these clusters represents uh, a brain region, 
So you can use Monte Carlo simulations uh, in this uh, uh, toolbox to provide uh, optimal location of each uh, emitter and detector, so for each optode, considering the maximum sensitivity uh, of this region of interest you, you, you selected uh, before. And after this initial testing, we concluded that NIRS could be so a, a very powerful uh, uh, tool to tackle these questions and test models about brain function in more constrained, uh, unconstrained uh, situation, uh, if you compare to fMRI. Um, but I believe experimental design should should take into account, uh, well, at least two points. First, um, uh, you need a, a clear focus on the cognitive components you would like to investigate and uh, whether the, the paradigm, uh, you know, the, the task the, uh, the subject will, will do uh, uh, is able to provide the, the, the information you, you need. So, um, uh, the foundation of the experiments is uh, the hemodynamic uh, variation um, between across uh, a condition. So we first must assure that the difference in the cognitive components uh, 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 between uh, these conditions are uh, suitable and adequate to answer the questions you have. We, we call this the, the contrasts. Um, the second point is that analytical procedure, uh, uh, remember that I'm a statistician, so uh, the second point at, uh, in the analytical procedure should be uh, defined previous to the data acquisition and not after. Of course, you can explore uh, uh, using more, more tools after the data collection, but before collecting, uh, it, it's desirable that you, 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 you have some pipeline defined previously. Previously, so um, and of course, uh, methodological refinements and advances could also be applied a posteriori. And uh, but a predefined pipeline is is is, is recommendable. Uh, otherwise, you will um, be at risk of collecting the data. Uh, of many, you know, subject groups and intervention um, to later conclude that, that, you know, there is no, there is not a good way of analyzing the data, if you have not thought this before. So, uh, <clears throat> I, I know this seems to be obvious, but I have seen many researchers in the areas, not, not only in years or fMRI, but in all areas of science, uh, um, that make this, you know, enormous efforts to collect massive data. And uh, after they finish the acquisition, they start to thinking how to analyze the data. So my point here, um, if, which is one of the main, uh, let's say, uh, talks of this talk, is that the experimental design and the data analysis must go hand in hand, okay, and previously to the acquisition. So uh, one possibility for the experimental design, and um, which is the most applied, uh, are the, the ones established in literature by fMRI, such as block and event-related designs. And since the neurohemodynamic coupling um, is the the physiological process that leads to the interpretation, uh, uh, the lead interpretation of both uh, fMRI signal and fNeurs. Uh, there is no apparent reason not to use the, 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 the same approach for the design of experiments. Um, I will not enter in uh, you know, deep in detail, details on this uh, because uh, I think th this will be discussed later uh, in the, the Sand Zone uh, uh, Symposium. So, uh, I, <clears throat> and in this case, the application of the general linear model and uh, uh, as, a, as the main analytical tools is well established in the la, the, the, for the last uh, 20 years. <clears throat> and 
For example, in this paper we published in Gate, Gate and Posture, we investigated motor regions uh, and dynamic chains in a single stack task in a, using an event-related design uh, and with a random uh, time interval in order to avoid the, you know, the predictability of the, the task. And here we, we can see that oxyhemoglobin changes after the stimuli show uh, a pattern which is very similar to the hemodynamic, uh, the canonical hemodynamic function uh, using, using most statistical uh, parametric maps. Uh, we call this uh, the, the SPMs. So, uh, but it, however, it, uh, this individual, each one here is one subject, this individual analysis also shows that there are, are subject specific changes as well. So uh, we are all alike, but also different in our own way. Um, in this uh, second study, based on 15 health subjects, we used a conventional block design experiment to investigate uh, the uh, left, left hand piano playing, uh, no chords, arpeggios, playing and training uh, in the order of minutes. So it's not a, you know, a, a mid-term training, it's a training in the order of minutes. And all participants were uh, right-handed and never participated uh, uh, in piano playing classes uh, previously. And they were, um, the participants were uh, instructed to uh, alternate between rests and uh, a task uh, with, uh, of arpeggios, of four note uh, chords, with uh, 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 a very quick, difficult level assessment after each uh, uh, block. Um, so these conditions were repeated 10 times, and there, a prefrontal montage was used in this, uh, this uh, experiment. And uh, here, uh, group statistics based on the general linear model uh, suggests uh, significant hemodynamic changes of the task, the, the arpeggios playing compared to the rest of the right prefrontal cortex. And uh, interestingly, after this uh, uh, signal preprocessing and calculation, calcul uh, by calculating the average oxyhemoglobin concentration, at each task uh, uh, block, at each block, we we found this U in panel B. Uh, we found this uh, inverted U-shaped curve across the blocks, and the uh, meanwhile participants' performance, which is the correct arpeggios execution, increased up, uh, across trials, and also the self-report difficult levels decreased over time. So. Uh, we, we may think, interpret this as uh, perhaps the brain was uh, becoming more efficient uh, to carry, carry uh, out this task. Sorry. Um, uh, in this third study, based on uh, 10 professional violinists, um, uh, it was do it uh, with uh, FNAS hyper scanning. We, all, we also applied uh, this uh, block design uh, experiments. And, uh, oops. Uh, the duos played a Bartok piece, which uh, the main uh, difficulty is the interaction between the musicians because uh, there are changes in the tempo. The other, you know, musicological features, and this is why we we choose. Uh, this is why this piece was chosen. Um, so uh, we simultaneously, why are simultaneously uh, acquiring the FNIR signals of the the two participants? Four blocks uh, or conditions uh, were considered. Uh, the uh, both violinists are in rest or the violin one playing solo, violin two playing solo, 
And the fourth condition is the duo playing uh, uh, together. And of course, it's not the same notes. The, uh, there is a piece for two violins. They are playing completely dif uh, different uh, uh, notes. And when compared to the solo condition, uh, we found a significant activation of the temporal parietal junction in violin two during the, the duo, but not in violin one. And considering that violin one uh, is the leader uh, is, is the leader of the duo, uh, and also that the temporal parietal junction is often reported as involved in you know mentalizing uh, empathy. We believe this finding may be interesting to raise some discussions in, in this field. And um, so another application of block design experiment is neurofeedback studies. So here we, we, we have papers from our group um, on affective neurofeedback. So uh, is the um, evocation of um, positive, negative, or neutral memories uh, and braid decoding. So this is, uh, 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 here we, we, we use a combination of machine learning and neurofeedback to create a, a, a score of brain states uh, to match some uh, conditions just like uh, the ne negative, neutral, or positive, mm -hmm. which were uh, uh, organized in blocks. So the, the, the main application of this, yeah, this approach is the potential intervention for psychiatric disorders. Uh, the, the, this is uh, this, this paper were published with uh, healthy subjects, but uh, you know uh, perhaps this tool could be useful in psychiatric uh, uh, disorders such as anxiety, uh, obsessive compulsive disorder, and, and depression. So. Well, although <laughs> uh, undoubtedly less constrained than fMRI, we, it's very hard to do this test I've shown before in fMRI. Many of you uh, may be asking, uh, is really this uh, real, <laughs> real life neuroscience? Uh, well, if you, uh, statistical inference is based on sampling for a population uh, in this so specific experimental conditions, block or event related. Uh, what is the possible generalization? We could do this to more, you know, real life uh, situations. And uh, so uh, all models are wrong, but some, some are useful. Uh, this quote is from a very uh, famous, um, amazing statistician named George Box. And basically it says that no single model captures the full reality. And this is why I, uh, they are models and not a second reality. But uh, however, uh, th these models can also be, be useful. So uh, what I mean is that we have a trade-off between the, the conventional control, experimental control, uh, you know, perfect in laboratorial conditions, and uh, the usefulness, uh, usefulness in real life uh, situations. And unfortunately, real life uh, is very different from this uh, constrained laboratorial conditions. And the confounders will always be present. And uh, so the results uh, will only point towards that direction, will not you know, prove anything, but point uh, to, towards some uh, directions. And any strong statement could be an overstatement due to this lack of experimental control. So um, Paraphrasing box, uh, show me a real life experiment that it will show you a missing confounder. And, uh, but 
uh, is it even possible to analyze the FNIR's data in daily activity? Such, you know, uh, listening to a specific uh, music uh, piece or watching uh, a video in YouTube or a video lecture, um, they were not acquired in a block design. Uh, you know, and also considering the connective components, sub subtractions I mentioned previously. And in this case, the conventional general linear model uh, will not be uh, uh, suitable. So uh, how, how, how could we correlate the brain hemodynamic states with uh, uh, individual behavior in these kind of situations? So uh, it only makes sense to acquire the data, uh, if you, as I said before, if you already have a plan on how to analyze them, so uh, 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 the analytical tools, are, uh, analytical tools available, are crucial to the desi design of the experiments. And uh, in this paper we published last year, on, uh, written by uh, by Candida. <coughs> We introduced a novel statistical uh, uh, approach based on the concept of intersubject correlation, uh, which was first uh, introduced by Yuri Hassan in fMRI. And so, if all subjects were presented to the same, exactly the same stimuli, such as the same video or the same music excerpt, the, the approach is based on the uh, uh, Calculating the pyrrhize correlations between the preprocessed pre FNIR signal uh, 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 um, of different subjects, channel by channel. So, uh, we suggested that this intersubject correlation could be used to define a distance matrix um, among all subjects. Um, and this approach, uh, uh, we combine this, uh, uh, this idea with another approach, which is multivariate distance matrix regression, or MDMR. Um, so this, given this um, brain distance matrix among subjects and the behavioral data, distance between the behavioral data, using this approach, it is possible to statist statistically test uh, whether the subjects uh, uh, with similar behaviors are also close in terms of this brain similarity, the brain similarities. So uh, the question here is, uh, can we investigate the, the, the brain response and behavioral data when subjects listen uh, the same musical uh, excerpts? So, um, we illustrated this uh, approach uh, in 32 uh, healthy subjects, which were exposed to four um, uh, excerpts from Wagner's uh, musical pieces. And they discovered, uh, of course, I described in the paper, but only the Siegfried Funeral March, uh, which was the piece with the highest, highest negative balance, were found to induce uh, uh, brain changes which were correlated with this, the, the behavioral response, which in this case were, was uh, perceived emotions uh, assessed by using a self-report questionnaire. And uh, this significant founding, uh, uh, finding was found uh, both for oxy and also desoxy hemoglobin. And we can also identify which channels were the most uh, contribu contributing the most to this result. And in red here in this uh, maps are the uh, oxyhemoglobin changes at the anterior medial prefrontal cortex, and in blue, uh, the left portion of the prefrontal cortex. Um, so using this approach, we also deal with uh, 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 another common, which is uh, a common problem in neuroimaging in general. Uh, which is the multi multiple statistical tests for each channel. Uh, because if you do a, 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 a channel-wise multiple comparison correction, uh, this will lead to a decrease in power if you use a Bonferroni uh, method. Uh, 
for example. Here, so only one p-value is obtained regarding the correlation of this brain uh, functional similarities and the behavioral response. And then you can do identify the channels which are most uh, contributing to the result in a post hoc fashion. Um, this is a, a collaboration with Suelen from uh, um, João Pessoa, um, Paraíba. And uh, this is a, an analogous situation to music listen, listening, which is a, 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 you know, a casual visual presentation. And the, this is, is still unpublished, but 25 healthy children, this uh, experiment was conducted in children, from three to eight years old, um, watch it to uh, this uh, video's name, Escapes, um, which uh, was designed um, by a group in Yale University uh, for resting state, resting state acquisition in children. So, uh, uh, um, this video uh, is not exactly a resting state, but uh, it was shown in a, in a, in a uh, published paper uh, validating this stimuli that uh, most resting state uh, uh, um, networks were still detectable. And uh, well, <clears throat> I would just go quickly here because uh, I have a problem with time. So uh, in this case, um, our main concern was to develop an analytical method to explore these questions. So can we use FNIRS to identify key moments in this video? And which brain regions are involved? So uh, we, uh, we developed a, 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 an approach using uh, graph theory I will not uh, 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 enter in detail because I don't have uh, 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 the, 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 the time for that. So I will just keep uh, the methodological part and go to, to results, which I think is more, uh, more important. So for, uh, for the re results uh, and using a prefrontal montage, we, uh, uh, that the, the, the the similarity, uh, th there was a similarity uh, in, in, uh, in the signal across subjects. And we could also map the, the, the brain regions which were leading to this uh, identification uh, of this uh, 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 special, uh, this uh, highlighted regions on this video. So, um, Applications in cartoons, advertisements, animations could also uh, be, be interesting. So, and we are we are all working on this. Um, okay, just a second. I will just will skip some slides here. Uh, regarding the applications of um, neuroscience and years in the field of education. In this uh, paper, we used NEARS in uh, uh, 18 adults during a video lecture about astronomy at an undergraduate level. And the lecture lasted around 40 minutes. And we used a prefrontal montage while the participants watched uh, uh, the, this video lecture. And uh, so during the lecture, uh, 10 questions were asked to the participants in, 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 you know, in the middle uh, of the, uh, the video. And these questions were strategically uh, elaborated because they, they refer to some very, very specific content presented previously in these videos. So uh, the questions were um, um, multiple alternatives and with only one correct. And uh, except by the, using the, the FNIRS cap, this is a situation which seems to be very similar to uh, uh, real life uh, uh, situations, mainly during the pandemics. Uh, 
And so the, can we predict the right or wrong answer using solely the hemodynamic states during the specific content presentation? And well, of course, in this case, we cannot disentangle uh, motivation from attention and memory. Um, but it, it, it lo looks like the uh, science, science fiction uh, movie, a Minority Report. Can we <laughs> predict uh, the answer before uh, it, it is made? So, um, in order to tackle these questions, we use it. Uh, the information of oxy and the oxy and two machine learning approaches um, to to answer this question and uh, we they put to this uh, method were the average uh, of the preprocessed the hemodynamic states um, of the channels during the time window of the content uh, presentations of each questions and uh, the output. Well, were, it was if the question, well, uh, the answer was right or wrong. So um, we use it uh, some uh, an appropriate cross cross validation approach to to avoid bias, and the result is that surprisingly, uh, the results were uh, better than chance. Um, uh, Using a proper statistical test, and which an area under the curve above 65% for both random forest and the elastic nets. And uh, remember that expected value under chance uh, would be 50%. So the, the, the values are not strikingly, but they were statistically better than chance. And uh, in the same way, we could also map the brand regions uh, uh, contributing the most to this, uh, uh, to the accuracy and to the uh, identification. And in this other paper, in the, in the educational context, we illustrated how news hyperscanning could be useful, useful to investigate teacher-student interactions, and. Um, well, uh, a very hot topic in in pedagogy and education, educational theory, learning theories, uh, is um, this uh, concept of uh, uh, proximal uh, developmental proximal zone and social interactions for effective learn uh, effective learning. So um, um, the idea is that the teacher mediates the potential learning uh, of the students. Uh, making him or her l uh, learn more. So um, we illustrate this experiment with a female teacher and a three-year-old girl. We uh, used a board game in which the, ch the child had to toss two dice and sum up the outcomes. Um, the task of uh, the teacher was to, to, to teach the, the girl, the small girl, how to sum these numbers and uh, help also offer, help the, the child to execute uh, the task. And the cat montage uh, was designed to focus on temporal parietal junction and bilateral uh, uh, prefrontal cortex. And the, the layout was the same in, in both participants. And this was uh, the first at attempt. And uh, according to, to uh, um, our hypothesis, um, we would expect that the oxymobilin signal and the, uh, of the temporal parietal junction of the teacher um, will be correlated with the prefrontal sign, signal of the child. And we, in this first attempt, surprisingly, we found it. And uh, um, as I mentioned previously in the violin duo experiment, temporal parietal junction uh, uh, is usually reported as involved in empathy and mentalizing processes, uh, while the, the, the prefrontal cortex is uh, known to be involved in cognitive control. So again, we are not here to prove any pedagogical theory, 
but our aim was to demonstrate that this kind of experiments could be done using FNIRs. So uh, I'm, I'm saying this because we need to avoid <laughs> overstatements and generalization. We must be very, very cautious. And uh, okay, we'll just skip some slides going to some uh, other slides here. Uh, oops. No, not this one. But some uh, some anyone that so some tips I would like to some difficult in collect data uh, in children. Anyone who has kids already know this, but the kids are always discovering new ways and <laughs> to interrupt the experiments. And when you did, you know everything, you did the intervention now few the behavioral questionnaires, started the experiments, and then during the acquisition, something unexpected happened, you know. So, uh, or they, they need to go to the bathroom, or they sneeze and need uh, to clean uh, their noses. So be prepared, uh, real life experiments, uh, uh, some very interesting things will will happen, and so it, 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 it's very good to do some you know pilot studies before trying to at least to to track the, the some common problems. So uh, some uh, cautionary notes um, nowadays uh, every reviewer will ask about superficial signals artifacts. And uh, uh, you probably will need a proper hardware for measuring short distance channels. And of course, this cannot be made a posteriori, but during the acquisition. Uh, second, uh, head motion is always a problem, uh, although manageable in many cases in, in, uh, in news. And it is important to use some analytical strategy to deal with the motion artifacts, such as PCA or wavelet filtering. And uh, particularly, if possible, it is interesting to have a simultaneous acquisition with an accelerometer as well, and an accelerometer placed in the head. And uh, I also recommend uh, recording in video all your acquisition, because, uh, uh, and also the stimuli screen of the participants. Because as I mentioned, uh, some unexpected events happens, and it's important to have this data for quality control and uh, after uh, after experiments. Okay, um, so uh, uh, in order to finish uh, presentation, I would just highlight some points. This is a very interdisciplinary field, and the contribution from all areas of knowledge. Uh, uh, are not only welcome, but really necessary. Remember that all models are wrong, but uh, and, uh, the idea is that our job is to discover how to make them useful to, to the purpose we have. And uh, I think that is, uh, well, as, I were, as I said, uh, I think applied neuroscience can make uh, a difference in social change and even for, you know, uh, public policies. And I would like to thank uh, Nayarx, Jackson, Sionac, Sao Paulo Research Foundation, Federal University of ABC, all co-authors and collaborators, and uh, 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 public managers from the sector of education who support this uh, research. And um, so thank you so much. It was, a, again, a pleasure to be here. I just hope you are still in here because I was not uh, with the meet window open. <laughs> oh, thanks, God. <laughs> Good. Okay. Thank you very much.
very much, Professor Sato. We have a few questions from the audience. I will read them now to you, okay? Thank you. Um, Adeline Stavino asked, uh, she says, asked something, she says, thank you, Professor Sato. About the FNIRS applies with musicians, in each musical, musical blocks, how many times the musician should repeat the same except to have an acceptable observation of the signals? Okay. Uh, I don't remember in oh, my oh, heart. Sorry, sorry, Professor. She has a complementation of the question. Uh, okay. The question. What will be the ideal duration of each excerpt and the duration of the rest between each excerpt must be the same as the musical excerpt duration? Thank you. Okay. So the idea is that each excerpt should be around 30 seconds uh, first uh, in order to have a, a better signal-to-noise uh, ratio. The number of repetitions, uh, as I said, I don't know it uh, by heart, but um, desirably at 10, and uh, certainly above 5, more than 5. Um, uh, yeah, so the number of uh, this will impact on the duration of your experiment. Usually, we try to keep it less than 15 minutes because, uh, uh, of course, the, 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 the participants get tired, they, the fatigue uh, uh, could be high, the fatigue could be high if the experiment is long. So we try to keep it around 15 minutes in adults and around five minutes in children. Uh, well, I don't know exactly um, what she means, because this depends on, on your research question. Depending on your research question, the experiment design will be completely different. So, uh, um, we, I think we need to discuss uh, more deeply to, to define the, the organization of the stimuli. Uh, anyway, uh, I, oh, now I see that I forgot to put one email of contact here. Let me just, uh, perhaps I could, let me see if I can uh, do an annotation here and insert, annotate um, text. My email, uh, my contact email is, oh, God, okay, here. Uh, just a second, I'll just increase the, okay, great. Um, my email is, So, uh, if anyone would like to discuss uh, more deeply, and it will be a pleasure for me, this is my email for contact, okay? okay. Thank you so much for uh, your attention, and uh, I please write me. It's, it's a pleasure to me to 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 collaborate. And again, Mariana, Edgar, thank you so much for your kind invitation.